Heath Shea, everyone. Shout out to Blackout for uh, checking on me, making sure I'm healthy. I appreciate that, brother. Thank you. Um, last time, I believe we left off on the low, uh, claim of the little... Yeah, sorry. I, I'm, I can't talk right. I have a... Um, uh, I've got some cough drops in my mouth. I got sniffles. Once again, and I double checked last time I did this video um, or series, the last installment of this series of uh, genealogy videos, I had um, the flu. So I'm much better than I was then, but I still got some kind of stupid uh, bug. And uh, I'm not alone. My family keeps getting sick because I keep getting sick. So anyways, uh, now that I've cleared my throat. Um, yeah, I believe last time we were on the, uh, I know for a fact, we're in the claims of Little Creeks. So, um, <clears throat> and that was, yeah. So I covered there's some people that are my ancestors, some that probably aren't. And um, yeah, so here we got the 1970 or 1870 Little Creek abstract going by first name. And um, it's like, you know, four Waxy Hydros, right? And um, 216 is my ancestor. Okay, 35 at the time, 1870. So again, you go back 35 years, you know, you're in 1835. Around the time he was born, roughly. So he would have been on the removal. He would have been a, a baby and uh, or a little kid, you know, around the age of my boy, maybe a little younger. And uh, yeah, all three of those guys. And then this other dude would have been uh, in his early teens. So... Anyways, uh, thought that out there. So then we got, um, let's see, Little Creek Abstract by last name. And um, none of the guys on that page, but then on this page right here, 512, Hopieth Hajo, right? Hopieth Harjo, um, or Hopieth Lihajo, right? Creek 56. I'm, I imagine this is also 1870, but I'm not 100% for sure on that. Um, I, this is, this is again from uh, free pages, genealogy roots web.com. This has been on the internet for quite a while, like 20 years, something like that. All right, so we got uh, Puthali Hola's uh, regiment, Friendly Creek Indians. There's um, Hopoyeth Hacho, private. Now, I'm not 100% sure that's my guy. Uh, it could be, but I don't know. In my personal records, I don't have any information about him being. Anything other than a refugee. Now, this one doesn't say refugee on it, but my uh, proof of airship document I, I showed before, uh, that does actually uh, have him listed as a refugee. So, um, if he's older, I mean, he still could have fought at the age of, like, you know, like 56 or younger if that was, in fact, his age in 1870. He was already a grandfather with a bunch of grandkids. Already taking care of his two daughters-in-law that were both married to his son at the same time. So, according to the... Um, According to the digging that I've done. So, <clears throat> anyways, this could be my guy. It may not be, um, but I, I keep it here as a possibility. Okay. Creek Census Muskogee Nation, 1882. All right. So, um, our, okay, check this out. Arbika, Arbika, Jacob Knight Town. I, I may or may not have covered this in a previous video. Um, that I actually uploaded because <laughs> I did like when I first started doing these I was at my mom's house as some of you might remember and I was recording you know a whole bunch of stuff I did like three videos that night and I ended up deleting two of them or maybe I did four videos I deleted three of them in any case I only uploaded the first one but look at this he's not even on the first page but JK 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 okay this is the guy who's signing for money basically that's what that represents as I understand it so, um, but yeah, you got the number of the person, you got the name, you got the age, you got, you know, who signed for them. Uh, I guess Kramer signed for all these folks right here. And then you have like the sex, male, female, male, female, blah, blah, blah. Um, oh yeah, there's only two genders, by the way, for a reason. Cause you know, throughout human history, we've always known that contrary to modern day, um, idiotic opinions. So I'm just going to throw that out there. So you guys know where I stand in case you couldn't figure that out already. <laughs> so <laughs> gotta throw that out there because I'm you know I'm, I'm a common sense person when it comes to basic biology okay uh, anyways Jacob Knight hopefully this doesn't get a, a, a strike for hate speech or whatever um, I, I'll fight it if it does anyways 
Um, yeah, so, <laughs> sorry, lost some thoughts here. So here on, on page two, it gets interesting. So on page two, oh, it says like, no, no number on page two. But then it says Arbica, not Arbica, but Arbica, the way we typically spell it now. So multiple spellings of the same town on the same document, okay? Jacob Knight, Martha, you know, quotation marks as a knight, okay? So Jacob is 31, 1882, so, in 1852, he would have been, you know, um, about a year old. So, 1850 is when he's allegedly born. I, I have reason to believe it was 1849, but in any case, um, 1849, 1850, that would still kind of line up. He could have turned 31 that same year after this was written. So, but Martha, 28, about three years younger than him. Janetta Knight. Remember Janetta? Two. Uh, that is not Sally, my great great grandmother, by the way. Ginny Yargi, nine. That would be the stepdaughter of Jacob. That would be the daughter of Martha by uh, Jeff Yargi, according to the um, Campbell Creek Roll, okay? Around 1900 ish. Okay, so then you got Wilson Knight, Fuller Knight. That, that's his wife, and uh, I believe, right? Is that no, no, wait, no, that'd be his kid. Uh, I don't even, I'm not even sure. Uh, Fuller, oh yeah, male, That's, that, that would be a son. Some of these names I don't even know. So Nancy Nata Knight, female, it doesn't even say the age, it just says female. Oh, then it says 58, what? Interesting, I, I, gotta, I gotta research that further, I'm looking at that correct, right, yeah. No, no, hold on a second, let me, let me yes, yeah, then Ike is six and female. Um, Jackson Knight. Sign. So Jacob might sign for himself. Who does that? Unless they are, in fact, probably the town king. Now, I've done some other research on... Uh, there's some... Regarding the um, 1899 uh, influenza type stuff, there, there's um, some documents I found on the National Archives that indicated that um, it, it interviewed Wilson Knight... Because you notice how he signed for his self also. Now, it's not Arbica Wilson Knight Town. It's Arbica Jacob Knight Town. So Jacob Knight probably was the town king at that time. But Wilson Knight and also one of the other brothers, I think Jackson, in fact. Um, well, notice how Jackson doesn't sign for himself. Jacob signs for him, right? And then Jacob also signs for Jackson's entire family. Wilson signs for his own entire family. So um, Jacob... Wilson and Jackson were all, well, okay, I know for, for a fact that Wilson and Jackson, according to their own sworn testimonies regarding the events, again, of 1899, and this is in like 1906, uh, 1905 or 06, when I, um, when they, you know, were interviewed regarding people that died of the flu and all the flu camps and all that ho horrible crap that was going on, how, you know, uh, blankets were burned in piles over at so-and-so's, near so-and-so's farm, et cetera, um, so what happened is they said that they were town that they were the former town king of Arbica. Or or, you know, uh yeah. So it's weird to think that they're a former town king. Because nowadays, and even before that, if you're the Miko of a of a ceremonial grounds or this the tribal town, um, you actually were in fact in a lifetime calling. You you were not, especially not, you know, just a few, you know, 20 years older than this. You didn't retire from that job, generally speaking. But these guys apparently did. Jacob Knight, well, I'm sorry. He was murdered by a couple of white cowboys that he uh, he himself had hired. So, um, anyways. Um, just interesting to go through this. So, um, but Jacob signed for Jackson. So, I'm assuming that maybe when Jacob died, Jackson might have taken his place. Or maybe he, he at any point after 1882, he probably became one of the town kings. Now, I understand that in a... Um, in the uh, Itawa, in the, in, the, in, this, in the tribal town, you have, and I, I covered this, I think, in that first video again, where um, Swanton, you know, wrote, he, he drew out how the ceremonial grounds for each of these towns was laid out. And you'll notice that, uh, like, there's a house of kings and a house of warriors that sit in their own separate areas like near the chief and the second chief or whatever. I mean, depending on how each one is structured, you have that type of thing going on. So 
you can have multiple town kings, quote unquote, at the same time, I guess. You have a house of kings within that town. You also had a house of kings over the entire Creek Nation. Um, probably made up of like the main Miko of the town, right? But then you have these other, and you have the, the, the Miko, the, the Hiniha, which is the second chief. And then you have like the house of kings. And then you have the house of warriors. And then you got all the clans and you've got all the, all the um, you know, anybody who might be visiting the town. Or any no clanners, if they happen to have like a white or black mom, if they were accepted into that town, then they would have been, you know, they would have had a clan, but they would have still been, you know, in the town. Uh, mainly before this time period, because again, at that at this point, you had three colored towns, as they were called, um, and that's that's pretty much where if you if you were a freedman, if your mother was a freedman, I should say, then you would actually go to one of those towns. Uh, but if your mother was, you know, Indian and your dad was a freedman, well, then, you know, like in the case of uh, Silas Jefferson, you would go to one of these uh, actual traditional uh, towns. So that's just how it was. So for those of you who are watching who haven't been paying attention to my videos in more recent times, I'm just kind of giving you guys a, a bit of background again. Um, so, <clears throat> so yeah, because it was very matrilineal. So again, though, like if these guys, okay, not, not all these brothers had the same mom. They had, there's two different moms that these brothers shared. And uh, I can't remember if Wilson and Jackson are, are both half siblings of Jacob or what the deal is. I have to double check uh, my, my documents. Um, in any case, uh, the mom, the moms could have been from the same clan. They could have even been sisters. That wasn't a totally uncommon thing to happen. I mean, you know, uh, Nadawaga, Nadiwaki, Nardawaki, you know, he could have married two sisters that blonde Torbika, and he could have like, you know, I mean, that would have been okay, you know, and then they would have been close to each other and each other's kids because they would have been clan mothers to each other's kids, not to mention maternal aunts. Okay, so it, there would have been a certain, that would have been a more reasonable situation. And on top of that, um, instead of building a separate house for each of them, you could have, they could have actually all lived in the same house because they were all in the same clan. It would have been a more amicable situation. Whereas in Jacob's case, he married uh, Martha, you know, Creek, and then he also married Melinda, who was a white, redheaded woman. And he had them both in the same house, and that was not the right thing to do. And they were... Uh, According to the Pioneer account that I read, which I need to find and print out, they were constantly at Dagger's Point. So Jacob didn't do the traditional Creek way of doing uh, polygamy. He should have actually had two separate houses for his two separate non-related wives. Whereas, again, I think that his mother and his stepmother were probably siblings or maybe they were, but they, because they're both Indian, maybe they got along better. I don't know. Um, either way, it's, you know, I wouldn't be surprised because if, all the, if these half-siblings are part of the House of Kings or they're all town Mikos of the same town. Either they happen to be this, of the two leading clans. Each of these women were from leading clans. At that you know, Each of them could have had sons that were uh, town king. Or um, maybe it just turns out that um, they, they were the same clan. Um, so yeah, anyways. Here is the um, free pages print out of the same document. And... Um, Okay, it's got, I, no, I, I highlighted JK because Jacob Knight signing for all this stuff, okay? And then, you know, of course, you have, like, you know, Jacob signing for himself. You have all the different, you know, uh, oh, yeah, you have William Knight as well. So, his wife, his kids, you got uh, Genochi Knight. Some of these some of these kids died um, around the early 1900s or 1899 because of that stupid flu. So, yeah, there's uh, a lot that was going on at the time. So, anyways, now we, sh we shift over to um, Greenleaf Town. So, I'm taking this, um, this thing out of my mouth here. Sorry, those, um, those <clears throat> cough drops are addicting. The honey with other stuff in them is really good. Anyways, Hodolgoji. Now, the way I'm pronouncing it that way, because not only is it probably how you pronounce it, it's actually how Buddy Cox pronounced it back in 2011 when I was at the archive. 25 at the time. Then you have Martha, 20. Paid Narbika. Jenny Yargi, 10. Jenny Yargi, 9. So basically, this was done afterwards. She had turned 10. Jonarti, no last name. Oh, yeah. Um, Jonarti, no age, also paid Darbika. 
Marthla, Jenny RG, and Gennardi are all paid at Arvika. But they're in the house of Hadol Hoji. I don't know who he is. Um, I'm wanting to assume he might be Martha or Martha, you know, the way it's, it's typoed here, that Hadol Goji might be a brother or some other, like, uh, relative. But I don't know. But he initially assumed, oh, she was married to this guy. It's like, no, nah, I know for a fact that at that time she was actually married to this guy. So, and polygamy did not work that way, okay? That would be polygamy, and uh, the Muscogee people don't do that, okay? Uh, at least not traditionally. So, if anybody's doing that, they're actually bringing tradition. <laughs> Just saying. All right, so, but you see, like, Janetta Knight, is, who's, like, you know, two years old, that's probably Jonarty. Because that genealogy is the same genealogy, you know, obviously. But then Mar Martha, Martha Knight, 28. Martha, 20. Now, here's the deal. I could be wrong, and that Martha could be a different person. I don't believe so. This is Paige Arbica. That has to be her. And yes, female. You know, again, two genders, male, female. Um, I think the 20, the, the zero, I think is a typo. I think that, that should actually say 28. Um, if I'm right about that, if my assumption is correct, and this Hodogoji is 25, I need to do some more research on, on, on any Hodogoji that might have been 25 around the year 1882. Because there's a Hodogoji Harjo, a reverend Hodogoji Harjo, uh, buried at Wynn Family Cemetery. And I, I've had this weird feeling it might be somewhat related. I took pictures there at one point and posted them on my Facebook. Um, I don't have them here on my YouTube, obviously, but... Um, that's just something to throw out there. I'm really curious about that. So, anyways, um, and then of course, I also save some uh, the same ETA2 census with, you know, got some Robinsons, got Lena McKellop, Thomas, and Willie. You got a couple of um, relations of mine. Well, Thomas and Willie are, Lena would be a step great great grandmother. So, and the Robinson would be, her name would be Elena Robinson. But because of her relationship to them and their relationship to my great-grandmother being older half-siblings, I had to make a copy of this. So again, here's the free pages version of this. Yeah, they... Hodol Goji, but they spaced it. This one's actually not spaced. That's the funny part. This one, I just noticed that right now. That one's not spaced. This one has spacing between all that. So for the most part, they're pretty consistent about the stuff. Like the spelling of Martha... And Peter Arbica, parentheses, parentheses, and having the ages as they appear on the document, and the no age right here. They, they, they did a pretty good job in this for the most part, but Hodol Go G, Hodol Go Chi, Chi. Well, it says the same thing here. Um, it, it's Hodol Go G, so it's like a little wind. So Hodolgi, I remember uh, one of the, the guys at the uh, archive went under the name of. Uh, um, Hodol Gihaya was his, uh, ceremonial name that he got as a kid, I think. And so, um, so yeah. And then, uh, Hodol Gomiko would be, um, you know, Wind King. That would be Silas Jefferson's, you know, Indian name. So anyways, moving forward here. Artusi Town. Um, I'm not totally sure, but I, I put, I gathered a waxy hard This is 1882. So this is not, uh, 1870. Um, so that's like 12 years after my Waxy Harjo would have been 35. So that actually the age makes sense. I don't know if this is my guy. This could literally be one of the three guys that were 35 in 1870. So I don't know. Be interesting though. Um, but yeah, I don't see Martha here. Of course, like, of course I wouldn't because Martha... So let's keep in perspective. So Martha, holy crap, wait a second. Maybe she was 20 back then. Maybe the Arbica role is actually an error because Waxy, Waxy Harjo, my Waxy Harjo, would have been 35 in 1870. So he would have been 42 in 1882. His daughter, Martha, probably was 20. <laughs> Man, I'm discovering new things about my family history as I'm doing this video. And that is uh, that is interesting. I need to... I need to reevaluate some things here. Now, I mean, it is possible. Let's just say, okay, 42, you, you take 28. No, he would have been 14 when he had her if he was 42 and she was 28 at this time. 
if I did the math right, you know, I'm again stuffy nose, but I think I did that right. Um, yeah, so yeah, I maybe she was 20. Maybe uh, Jacob got him young. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I mean, not too young, but I mean, he wasn't exactly an old man. He was still like, what, th was it 31? Let me just double check that here real quick. Um, yeah, 31. Okay. All right, moving forward. But whether this is my guy or not, my guy would have been that age. Whether he's Artusi or not, I don't know. He probably was Greenleaf. Maybe not. I, I really have no idea because I need to find out more information about this guy. And I'm having a hard time with that. I'm having a hard time finding out who Martha's mother was. I have no idea who she was. I have reason to believe that my Waxy Harjo would have been one of the Creek Orphans. Uh, one of the other roles. But uh, I have to actually verify more of that. So, okay. This is... See, I actually take the pages. This is from the microfilm. Because it has like, oh yeah, Creek Census Roll, February 19th, 1891. Names of citizens not enrolled and their respective towns not enrolled. Okay. You got Conchardi, you got Coeda. Okay, that's why I got this one because I got Coeda people. Um, that's why, why did I save this one? Um, I mean, obviously, um, there's a Mary Wolf blackout. There's a Mary Wolf here at Coeda. Oh, yeah. Joseph McKelt. There we go. Um, so, yeah. Seriously. Seriously, man. Mary Wolf. Um, uh, find out if that's one of your people right there, man. Or, or actually, I need to go back and look at the records you sent me. And um, But either way, just keep that in mind. Mary Wolf, uh, number 614 on the 1891 uh, role of uh, Coeda role of those who are not enrolled, I guess. But anyways, Joseph McKellop. Number 618, that's my uh, great-great-grandfather. So that's why I saved this. All right, this is interesting stuff right here. So this is uh, Criminal Court, Convene Courthouse, Deep Fork District, Muskogee Nation, September 18th, 1891. His Honor, Jacob Knight, Judge, Deep Fork District, presiding, uh, Smith Kennard. I believe that some of his brothers said, oh, we're from Arbica, Deep Fork. On, the, uh, on those 1906 documents I was talking about, about the flu or uh, influenza, pandemic, whatever. Um, but yeah, uh, I believe this probably is my guy right here. And I don't, then there's no, um, there's no timestamp, there's no URL. This probably came also from either a picture off of a website. I just like, you know, copied it and saved it and then printed it up later. Or uh, it might've came off a PDF, but probably, I think I just found the pictures. Um, so yeah, um, presiding uh, Smith, Kennard, prosecuting attorney in D.C., Watson, the clerk of the court, when the following citizens of Deep Fork were summoned as jurors to try the case. Names of jurors. Dick Barnett, James Barnett, uh, Art Artusi Field, Daniel Starr, you know, ba -ba 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 -bum. Daniel Wolf. Check it out, man. Wolf. Okay. So, um, Hadolgi Hajo. That might be the same. That could be Hadolgo G., but it might not be. That could just be crazy wind. Hadoki Hajo, okay? As opposed to little wind Harjo. You know, like Hadoki Ji Harjo would be little wind Harjo or crazy little wind, okay? Uh, anyways, Muskogee Nation versus John Simmons, defending witness Locha Fixico, attorneys at law, R.R. Bruner, uh, Alec Davis? Alec, huh? Anyways. Um, so yeah, it goes down, uh, for charges, theft is stealing uh, one and a half bushels of meal and one small sack of flour from, um, Maurice, Maurice Cobb, witnesses for nation, M Maurice, uh, Maurice Cobb. Yeah, that's spelled the same way, but the following 12 jurors were selected, uh, out of 24, um, again, Daniel Wolf. So... Um, interesting. So James Barnett, chairman, went on trial. The jury decided that this prisoner, John Simmons, charged theft, were guilty of the charges, and that he, John Simmons, shall suffer the penalty of the third offense of theft, which is death. And the court sentenced the, com the, um, the convict, should be convict, 
um, to be shot on the 30th day of September, 1891, 2 o'clock p.m. I hereby certify the above decision is correct. Jacob Knight, Judge, D4 District, uh, Muskogee, M MN from Muskogee Nation, D.C. Watson Clerk. So, yeah, my uh, my ancestor, I'm pretty sure this is him. Um, I mean, yeah. He sentenced the guy to death because the guy, I mean, back in those days, if you stole three times, if you were a thief and you're caught three times, they actually put you to death. I read that elsewhere recently, and as, as I'm going back over this, I'm going, geez, man. Uh, it was no joke, okay? Greenleaf, 1896, Colbert Census Roll, Creek Nation. Okay. Um, this time you have Hadogo G, Jenny R G, Sally L L E Y Knight. So, like, um, in most documents, it's L L I E, and my grandmother was Sally with with a Y. And her middle name was Bell with no E. <laughs> like, ring a bell. But anyways, uh, yeah, so Sally Knight. So they're in the household of... I, this is why I think Hidalgo G was probably like an uncle of some sort. He obviously wasn't their dad. Okay? Like, that, that obviously was not the case. They had, they had different dads from each other. Okay? Again, Jenny R.G., daughter of Jeff R.G., Sally Knight, daughter of Jacob Knight. But since we're going by towns that are, are matrilineal... And, um, you know, basically that's kind of why, and they were, and it was getting back towards that. They were trying to patrilinealize the towns before this, but they kind of got back on track. It would appear. Okay. Uh, payroll. Um, oh yeah. It's hard, it's hard to read here, but, uh, I'll get closer. Hazologo G. Ginny R. G. Sally L L I E Knight. And uh yeah, it gives like numbers next to them. I don't know what year this is. I need to uh to check. Um hold on a second. Yeah, this is actually the same document. I got two I made two copies of it. I do a lot of that. Okay. Thoplaco. I used to think I belonged to them because I'm pretty sure Jacob Knight, not Jacob Knight, uh, Joseph McKellop put my great grandma, his youngest daughter, on the same tribal town as the other kids, which is incorrect. Um, because it, it had to do with collecting money. I guarantee, like, I'm 99.9% .9 sure he was doing that to collect money. It's the same location and not have to worry about having to travel too much. So, um, anyways, Top Laco, 1896, Colbert Census Roll, Creek Nation. Okay, you got William Robinson. You got Alina McKellop dead. Thomas, William, Cherokee, Annie, Barney, and Alina, newborn. Interesting. Um, Minnie was the newborn that she died. Alina died in childbirth. Minnie was the one that was adopted out to Jacob Knight. And then Joseph met Sally, <laughs> who was probably 16 at the time. And he was in his 40s. But we won't talk about that. Uh, <laughs> all right. Um, this is the Thought Blocko Synthesis Rule undated, and it's handwritten. So you have, oh, but it doesn't have all the same names. But it doesn't have Alina dead. It says Thomas, William, Cherokee, Annie, Barney, and Alina, which again is probably many. So you have the undated and then the dated ones. The dated ones are, are typed, the undated ones are handwritten. So, uh, just something to keep in mind here. Okay, what is this? Um, A.P. McKellop, that's my great-great-grandfather's brother. Almarine Edward McKellop, that would be his son, I believe. So, yeah. Uh, well, the relatives of mine, so that's kind of why I did this. I mean, I have an immediate ancestor on that particular role. Um, honestly, that was for, yeah, Kawita. Then for Thalplaco, okay, this is where it's interesting. Joseph McKellop. And then he has a bunch of kids. It has Alina dead. Thomas, William, Cherokee, Annie, Barney. Um, doesn't have many or Alina, newborn, whatever, uh, the way it's written. But yeah, Joseph didn't belong to Toplaco. I think he just kind of put himself there to collect money there as opposed to collecting money at Coita. So 
Um, he was a smart guy. He wasn't very well educated, but he was sharp as a sharp as attack, as as they said in those same pioneer records I aforementioned. Okay, this year, Creek Census Rule, February nineteenth, eighteen ninety one. Names of citizens not enrolled in their respective towns. Okay, again, Coweta Town with a Coweta with a K. Okay, and then you've got. Do I have nobody here? And, I, and yes, I'm in it. Do I, do I have nobody here? Oh, no, I do have somebody here. Okay. Joseph McKellop. Just, just Joseph McKellop. That's it. This is kind of cool right here. And this is probably where I'll end this particular video because we're already 30 minutes in. Um, but we've got... Um, this is from Yuchi Children of the Sun. I need to read the entire book. There's a whole PDF file online. Um, it's been on multiple websites in the past, but right now it's on one particular, which I need to find. But this has to do with my ancestor. This has to do with the Hodges. So this is David M. Hodge of Tulsa, Indian Territory. Uh, being by me first duly sworn, deposes and says that he's a citizen of the Creek Nation of Indians by blood, and that he was born in Choska Creek Nation in 18, 1841. That would have been the same year that his grandfather, David McKellop, hence David M. Hodge, you know, um, so the maternal grandfather, maternal, because his dad was a Hodge, um, died in 1841. So Reverend David McKellop, or McCallop, or McKillop, depending on which spelling you want to use, uh, or depending on which spelling they wanted to use, and he was a Scotsman, okay? Um Affian further says David McKellop was his grandfather and that Susan per Perryman McKellop, his wife, um, was his grandmother and that she was the sister of Samuel Perryman, Moses Perryman, Louis Perryman, who's the father of Legacy Perryman, Krista Perryman, James Perryman, John Perryman, and Henry Perryman, all of whom come from the old nation in Georgia to this country with the first Creek immigration, again, 1828, I believe. Um, Athene further says that the children of David Mc Davis, again, typos happen, and Susan Perryman McKellop, his wife, were one, Nancy McKellop, who married Nathaniel Hodge, a white man, by whom she had the following children to wit. Milton Hodge, Altana Hodge, I can't name is Altana, David M. Hodge, the affiant Heron, Electa Hodge, Alvin T. Hodge, so David M. Hodge and Alvin T. Hodge were, were kind of important guys, Elam B. Hodge, Laura Hodge, Joanna Hodge, and Nathaniel Hodge, and two, James McKellop, the father of Albert Pike McKell, L. Albert P. McKellop, Albert Pike, Muskogee McKellop, Thomas J. McKellop, and Joseph M. McKellop, and Al Marina McKellop, and Major McKellop, and, and Robert McKellop, father of Mrs. J Janata Tiger Jack, and three, Rachel McKellop, um, or who married Harvey Porter, by whom she had the following children, the wit, Hiram Porter and Neoshi Porter, and and four, Susan McKellop, who married John Denton at Cherokee, by whom she had Mrs. Lila D. Lindsay of Tulsa Indian Territory. I swear, this right here, like a bunch of this information, minus the name David, or Davis, the way he spells it, this this goes straight into the Chronicles of Oklahoma, which is like, in the, I think the 1820s is when that was published, uh, or 1810s, something like that. Like, this whole listing, the way it's said, is almost, in some cases, word for word. Um, so, um, and also, by the way, I believe that um, either uh, Hiram Porter or, uh, Hiram Porter might have been the father of Pleasant Porter. I got to double check that, but Pleasant Porter is directly related to us. Okay. But yeah, so that um, Dave McKellop and his wife were the parents of Nancy, one, uh, to James McKellop, James Madison McKellop, um, Rachel McKellop, Susan McKellop. So they have these four kids. Affian further says that according to the statements of his mother, his grandfather and grandmother McKellop died while he was but a mere child. Yeah, he would have been like a newborn baby. Um, the former about the year 1841. Yep. And I actually remember seeing that the, a picture... A picture of the tombstone that I cannot find anymore because it disappeared off my Facebook conversation with my cousin who lives on the property that he's buried on. Like, they still own the property in Bixby. So, uh, for some reason, though, like, Facebook's weird about that. Maybe she deleted it off her phone, and so Facebook deleted it off of the, the message. I don't know. But uh, for some reason, it was no longer visible. And it was a picture she took of a video recording from the 90s 
that, uh, if I recall the conversation correct. And unfortunately, the tomb tombstone itself is missing. It, just went, it went missing some years back. And um, the only evidence that was ever there is that video. And I'd love to get a better image of that. So, um, so yeah, so right here it says, former about 1841, while affiant was but a very young baby. Yeah. Um, yeah, like I said, and the latter about the year 1845. So that means that, that Susan McKellop or Mary Susan um, um, McKellop, Perryman McKellop, uh, she was a, um, she died 1845. So, um, Oh, come on. Affian further says that according to the statements of his mother, his aunts and uncles, his grandfather and grandmother always lived together, and that his grandfather, McKellop, was an ordained minister in the Methodist Episcopal Church, Emmy Church, that's what that means, and a strict observer of all the rules and requirements. Affian further says that according to the best of his knowledge and belief, that his grandfather, McKellop, was not the father of any other children than those of his grandmother, Susan Perryman McKellop, Herein, before mentioned, David M. Hodge, subscribed and sworn before me on this 17th day of May, A.D. 1897. And it's got a seal, E.G. Tolton Jr., U.S. Commissioner. So this is how you do genealogy right here. You, you find affidavits, and you find them in weird places. U.G. Children of the Sun, why would this be in that book? I have no idea, but thank God that it is. Okay? I mean that. Um, so... Anyways, uh, the rest of this, I'll get into this later. There's a lot of like individual documents about um, the Knight family, but that can wait for the time. This is um, 36 minutes and 45, 47 seconds into this. Find things like this. This, is, this stuff is very, very important for verifying family lines. Um, because otherwise you're dealing with just a bunch of, a bunch of stuff that, that may not be correct. Look, there, there, there's errors in this to some extent. Like, again, Davis McKellop, that's not correct. David McKellop, it's a different spelling, same document, same person in question, but there's a typo. That, so there's, there's something incorrect on it, even though basically it's correct. But I've also heard that, that Susan is also Mary Susan Perryman McKellop. So, but again, fi but fi verifying that 100%. Outside of like the Chronicles of Oklahoma, for example, which is a much later, you know, recording of history. And unfortunately, it lists David as being James McKellop. And that's an error. But that's, but at the same time, that's where I hear that he came from Scotland. You know, so I have to do more research to, to verify some of these things. But um, it's probably correct. The, the Chronicles probably borrowed information directly from uh, Albert Pike McKellop. I have good reason to believe that, although I'm not totally sure. Um, I kind of suspect that. So, because it puts it, paints him in a very, very good light. So, anyways, um, that's it for this video. I uh, hope you guys enjoy. I hope you learned something about doing genealogy. So, see, I, we did this in the last couple videos and we got to this point. So, um, we're going to get, let's see. We're, we're going to get probably as far as this document right here. After that, um, there's a document somewhere after. You, you start getting into documents that are much more modern, which I won't really get into. And uh, also a document somewhere in that lower part of the stack that um, I'm not allowed to put on the internet. <laughs> Again, I swore my aunt Arlene I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't share that with my cousin that pissed her off. And, um, so as long as he's alive, at least as long as he and his brother are alive, I'm not going to post it. So, um, or I'll, I'll charge my son that he posts on the internet. So that way the future has it, but he doesn't, uh, he being my, that one cousin. So his brother really didn't do anything wrong, but his brother was kind of a, a delinquent. Um, but the, the cousin in question is the one that really like said and did some disrespectful things to my aunt and uh, may she rest in peace. And he told me some things like she was an embarrassment to the family and all this other stuff. And I'm just going, dude, I didn't talk to him after that. Like, I think he wished me happy birthday like a couple years later. And I, I just said, thank you. But that was pretty much it. Like I, you know, um, no one's life is perfect. My aunt's wasn't perfect, but come on, dude. You know, sh show some actual respect and dignity. This guy was married to a stripper. So you want to talk to me about embarrassment to the family? Come on, dude. Who marries a stripper? And then, and then goes and tells his, his, his great aunt, 
that, you know, or, you know, tells his cousin that the great aunt is, a, is an embarrassment. Uh, she was never a stripper. <laughs> Anyways, I'm not trying to be judgmental about strippers. I mean, but at the same time, I mean, let's be honest here. Um, you know, let's be honest. All right. Anyways, guys, uh, thank you all for watching. Um, I'll talk to you guys next time. I'll talk at you guys next time. Let me know what you think in the uh, description. Um, and uh, I'll talk to you guys later. Bye. -bye.